Our guest tonight is no stranger to the uh, Building and Realty Institute. We've had him uh, back here to speak with us several times. Uh, his name is Dr. Robert Goodman, and he's a well-known economic analyst and consultant. He is formerly uh, affiliated with Putnam Investments as their chief consultant, and while with Putnam, he was a member of the company's business advisory group, uh, a panel of experts on economic, business, and personal finance topics. During his career, Dr. Goodman has served as a consultant and chair and spokesperson before brokers, financial service industry, and business groups. He is consistently quoted in the media and appears frequently on the cable news network and has been a regular guest host on CNBC Squawk Box. He is the author of the popular book, Independently Wealthy, How to Build Financial Security in the New Economic Era. Dr. Goodman was Chief Economist with J&W Seligman and Company, Inc. from 1972 to 1989, and he has also been an economist at Citibank and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So once again, we are very pleased to avail ourselves of his, of his knowledge, his uh, good humor, and quick wit, and I call him up to the podium. Dr. Robert Goodman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, this is, I think, my fifth time. Albert said he's going to have me back till I get it right, so <laughs> I'm going to try. I know some of you have tight schedules. If you have to leave, and I'm serious, please, I don't get offended. Uh, just go. Uh, this is a, a very interesting time. First of all, Happy New Year to everybody, and I sincerely hope it is a Happy New Year. But uh, this is a critical, a critical time in our economic development. The period that we're in now, that we're in last year and the year before, is not unlike the period that we went through back in the 1930s. This is not the 1970s. And so it's very important for you and for analysts, business people, to understand the nature of the environment you're going to face, whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter what I'd like to happen. I don't know your business. No economist can tell you how to run your business. You know it better than, better than your competition. But if I can somehow give you some idea of the environment in which you're going to operate, you will know what to do to survive what could be a very, very difficult period. Let me give you an analogy, and you can use this with a client at a party. It puts what's going on in some kind of perspective. Our economic system is the most beautiful system ever devised by man. The market system, our market system, is designed to give us maximum growth at the least cost. If left alone, that's what it will do. It's powered us for 200 years. Even now, we're still the premier economy in the world by far. It's like having a rocket ship, a perfect rocket ship filled with fuel. And your objective is to put it in orbit around the Earth. And so you put it in orbit, and it's going around and around and around. But you know what's going to happen ultimately. The pull of gravity will pull it, and ultimately it will slow down, and it will plummet to Earth and burn. But it's filled with fuel. We're able to do something about it. We can give it some more fuel, some more energy, kick it into a higher orbit, and keep it going around and around. And if you want to go to the moon and Mars and beyond, you have to accelerate at a certain speed, and off you go. And we've got all that fuel in the rocket. But we won't use it. And that what, that's what bothers me as an economist. You've got kids that are taking economics. Every textbook that's been written in the last 75 years tells us what we should be doing. And we're not doing it, not for economic reasons, but basically for political reasons, for ideological reasons, we are tying our hands behind our backs. What we have in this country now is a problem with demand. It is not a supply problem. It is not the problem we faced in the 1970s and 80s when we had 12% inflation. 
when to get rid of 12% inflation if you used the demand policies developed in the 30s, we would have had to create a depression to get rid of that inflation. And so what we did with the genius that we have, we developed a set of policies that we called supply-side policies. Rather than dampening demand to get rid of that inflation, the idea was to increase our supply our productive capabilities, and it would do the same thing. And we did that. And we implemented it in a bipartisan way because we had no choice. Not because the Republicans wanted it more, more than the Democrats. We just didn't have a choice. And it gave us 20 years of prosperity in this country where the market went from 777 in 1982 to... 10,000 by the end of the century, and now we're at 17,000. But the problem is, over periods of time, our problems change. And right now, our problems are no longer supply-induced. They are demand-induced. We hear that while the economy is growing nicely in some quarters, wages are flat, deflated by minimal inflation, and real wages are going down. So consumers spend one month and they pull back the next. So consumer spending is flat. Investment spending? Businesses have $2 trillion on their books. It's all cash. You want to know why they're paying out more than dividends? Buying back their own stock? They have nothing better to do with the money. Would you build the plan today that's going to come on stream in three years? when you're uncertain about whether or not the demand for your product will be there to justify that expenditure? No, you don't. And so the, the cash piles up. You know what's going on in the rest of the world. This is no, no surprise. The rest of the world is shrinking. Our exports to the rest of the world are slowing down. So the consumer is flat, businesses aren't spending, and exports are slowing. There's only one area left that we can control of demand. And whether you like it or not, forget the ideology. Remember, you'll live in this whether you like it or not. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, the only area left that we can control is the government. In the 1930s, what people don't know, Roosevelt came in and he didn't know anything about economics. Nothing. He did know he had 25% of his population out of work. And what he said was, if we don't give them a paycheck, we will have a revolution, a real revolution. We literally have to pay a guy to dig a hole and pay his friend to fill it up. Give him a paycheck because they will spend it. They'll buy clothing and they'll put somebody to work. They'll buy food, they'll put somebody to work. It'll get spent and respent. And they started programs like the TVA and the WPA and, and CCC, all to put people to work, and it worked. They would demand management policies. They poured money into the system. And people spent the money, and guess what? And this is interesting, most people don't know it. Between 1929 and 1932, as the Depression unfolded, the Dow Jones, the stock market, which folks will reflect the health of our economy in the long run, good or bad, went from 400 down to 44. I mean, that was a hit, let me tell you. The unemployment rate went to 25%. Things were bad. But in 1932, because of the policies the government enacted out of fear and because they didn't have a choice, in the four years, 1932 to 36, the economy grew on average 8.5% a year. That's huge. We, in real terms, and we haven't done that since. People started to go back to work and the unemployment rate fell from 25% to 14. The Dow Jones reflecting the potential of this system went from 44 in 1932 to 200 four years later. Now, you still were half of where you were in 29, but that's a heck of a run if you saw it coming. But the problem was we didn't have escape velocity yet in 1936, like the rocket ship. But we started to worry about something else. To spend all that money, we had to borrow it. Our deficits were getting bigger. And our debt was piling up. And by 1936, when the economy was not yet at that liftoff speed, 
we try to do something about our debt and our deficit. We raise some taxes, cut some spending, try to get that deficit down, reduce the debt. And what happened was predictable. We fell right back into that depression, and the only thing that got, a, got us out of it was the demand created by World War II. And the fear was, after the war was over, that we would fall right back into a depression. Everybody coming back, they'd be unemployed. Where's the demand going to come from? And some genius came up with an idea to show you how these things happen. They called it the Marshall Plan, and what they did was, they said, look, we're the only country in the world with any productive capacity whatsoever. Let's lend the Europeans and the Japanese, let's give them $12 billion. In today's terms, that would be like a trillion because they can only spend it in the United States for their steel and their glass and aluminum, whatever they need, they can only get it from us. They have no productive capacity. That demand kicked us off for 25 years. Well, folks, today we have a demand problem, big time. And what are we doing? What do you hear on CNBC and all the pundits and all the, 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 the uh, Congress people talking about? Our debt and our deficit. Let me tell you something about our debt. This, this is interesting. Do you know today, with all of our problems, we can borrow money from the rest of the world, our enemies, China, Russia, you name them. They're dying to lend us money for 30 years, today, at 2.76%. Huh? 2.76. Pick your inflation rate over 30 years. You think it's going to be 2.76% per year on average? You know what that means? The money is free, folks. The money is free from our enemies. they got no place else to go. Don't let anybody tell you, oh my God, they won't take the dollar. What's going to happen? They don't have a choice. We're not Brazil. We're the only country in the world that can actually print its own money. Think of what would happen. Well, excuse me, man. What's your, name, your first name? Hi. Yeah. Nami. Lami? Nami. Nami. Nami, if you could take a piece of paper and write Nami on it and go to a restaurant, and afterwards the bill came and you tore a little piece of that Nami and you gave it to them, and they took it in payment for the dinner because they took it because they knew if they tore a little of that Nami, they could give it to the waiter and he'd be able to tear it and buy a, a suit with it. You could, you could print money too, but you can't. Brazil can't, but we can, because the world has no choice but to accept our dollars. Where do they go when they get scared? Where does Russian money go? Where does Chinese money go? Where does Danish money go and British money go? They come here. They buy our treasuries. With all of our trouble today, what are they doing? They're lending us money at 2.76%. Please take it, because it's safe in the United States. Because we have a stable government, whether you like the government or not, it's stable. We have the deepest capital market in the world. We can handle the trillions of dollars out there. And so we can borrow for nothing. And what we should be doing, and if you begin to hear people talking like this, all I'm saying to you is don't think it's a negative. Think it is a positive. We can take that free money and we can do with it things that really matter. Rebuild infrastructure, really get a return down the road, the roads, high-speed rail, tunnels, you name whatever it is. Give it to private companies to do it so the government gets out of it. Spend the money because you know what? When that construction worker gets paid, what does he do with the money? He spends it. And he puts somebody else to work. There's a multiplier involved. But we won't do it. And our rocket is slowing down. The Fed's done everything it can do. Now, I want to tell you something. You're going to hear the Fed chairman out there, and they'll tell you they can do this and they can do that. They will never tell you they can't do something. But they can't. Just like in the 1930s, they couldn't. They called it a liquidity trap. At some point, they cannot lower interest rates low enough to get people to borrow money to spend. That's how bad the attitude is. The Fed has had four QEs, quantitative easing, where they poured $4 trillion into the system, $4 trillion in the banks. The banks aren't lending it because nobody wants to borrow it. $4 trillion, and now they stopped. But that money is still there. That lend, those lendable funds are there. 
But you know what's happening? It's like severing an artery. And the doctor gives you a transfusion at one end of that artery, and the blood goes right out the other end. It never gets into the body. The liquidity that the Fed has being, been putting into the system has not gotten into the real economy. There is a disconnect. But it goes somewhere. And where did it go? Went in the stock market. Why not? It went into the bond market. Who ever, I certainly didn't think so a year ago. When we talk, rates were about 376 or 4% on a long treasury. To think that those rates would plunge to 276, as low as they were in the Depression, that's kind of a stretch. I didn't think so. But the liquidity goes somewhere, and here's what's about to happen. I think you may know this. The Europeans are going to try it on the 22nd of January. They're going to start a QE program. Our QE program took four years and four trillion dollars. I don't know how many years it takes, but liquidity can go anywhere. It'll find its way at the sovereign bonds in Europe. When a European looks over here and says, gee, I can get 2.76 in a U.S. government bond, why don't I buy that? A 10-year government today at 176, a 10-year Bund, is 47 basis points. Can you imagine? The money comes over here, so it would not be a stretch for somebody in a week or two on CNBC, everybody pays attention to CNBC, to tell you we could see a 10-year bond at 1%. That is not good news for you guys. I'll tell you what's good news. If people started to believe that rates have bottomed out and they're going up, you want to see people rush out to buy that home, to borrow that money before they got to pay 3% or 4% or 5 or 6 or whatever they'll be told at that point? That's the good news, when people believe rates will go up. But the real risk in this room, to all of us, is that if we don't do the right thing, and we do it soon, this rocket ship is going to start to crash and burn. It doesn't take much to affect confidence. The terrorist attacks here and terrorist attacks there, who knows what it will take. But if consumers pull back, if businesses pull back from where they are, if the world economy begins to implode and we get recession in Europe, if we slip into recession now in this country, how do we get out of it? We know the Fed can't do it. Once we start to spiral down, it spirals until it gets so bad we have no choice. Then they'll ultimately do what they need to do. It's like being in a rowboat, and I use these analogies because it just clears it up for me. It's like being in a rowboat with two oars, a monetary oar and a fiscal oar. And you got the monetary oar in the water and you're going with it as hard as you can. But you keep the fiscal oar in the boat. You know where the boat goes? Round in a circle. We got to put that oar in the water. Now there are plans to do just that. And you should know these things because as the debate goes on in Congress, you're going to hear about it. I know you think Congress goes away for a month or two and they don't do anything. They don't. But we don't care what they do. The staffs work on these things all the time. They've got a plan. There is a plan a demand-side plan to deal with this issue. It's in two parts. There's a short-term part and a long-term part. In the short run, the plan would be to cut taxes. Not for rich people necessarily, not increase them on rich people, no, 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 no. But lower taxes, lower on people who spend all of the money you let them keep. And increase government spending by borrowing money. And you know what that will do in the short run? It'll increase that deficit again. The kind of thing people go crazy about when they think. And debt will go up, but guess what? The money will get spent and the economy then begins to pick up. And that's when the second phase kicks in two, three, four years down the road. And it's all going to be laid out when it's laid out in one big piece. So you see it all. Because down the road, you do have to slow down the rate of growth of government spending. You don't cut it. You slow it down. And as the economy grows more quickly, believe me, revenues grow more quickly. And guess what? The deficits do tend to shrink for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. And what's really important is not 
the amount of debt. I, I think I saw $18 trillion we owe. I mean, you know, if you counted one dollar a second, it would take you about 150,000 years to count to that number. It's ridiculous. What matters to the markets, and more importantly to the rating agencies, is the debt in relation to the size of our economy. After World War II, we owed a hundred billion dollars. A hundred billion is nothing. But the size of our economy was 100 billion. We owed 100% of a year's GDP. Today, we owe 18 trillion. And it represents 100% of a year's GDP. If you do this right over the longer term, what happens while the debt will continue to grow and 10 years from now we'll owe 23 trillion? That isn't the point. If we grow faster than the debt accumulates, the debt ratio starts going down. The burden of the debt starts going down. If somebody came to you and wanted to borrow some money and told you that they owed a million bucks, what are they telling you about their financial condition? Nothing. You'd ask about their net worth and their income, their cash flow, all those kind of things. It's got nothing to do with the level of the debt. It's the burden of the debt. If the guy told you he made 20 million bucks a year and had 50 million dollars in net worth, you'd lend them all he could take away. If that debt ratio were to seen or be believed to be coming down, let me tell you what S&P would do. They put us on a watch list to upgrade us to a AAA rating again. And there's an incentive for them to do it, by the way. They're being sued by the government for a lot of money because of the ratings they gave the debt back in uh, 07 and 08. They'd love to be able to put us back, put that AAA back. We've got to give them a reason. That's a reason. In the meantime, in the short run, you're going to be dealing with a tremendous amount of uncertainty. This economy, we've had two quarters of relatively strong growth. Yeah, we'll take out inventories and all of a sudden you see you're still growing at around two, two and a quarter percent. That's not liftoff speed. Fourth quarter, we might see it go down a little bit from the third quarter. The real risk is that we start seeing consumers pull back for whatever reason. If they do it and we get into that hole, the markets are going to follow. You've got a market going like this and you've got fundamentals like that. And I know this, you have the 40 years in the business. One of two things has to happen. Either the fundamentals improve enough to justify the levels in this market or the market ultimately will reflect those fundamentals. That could be one nasty decline. So I just want you to be alert to the fact that that's the environment in which you operate. And personally speaking, it, what it means is don't take any risk that's not worth it. Okay? If you don't need the risk, don't take it. If you need 4% risk to get to your goal in 10 years, take a 4% risk. Not a 6% risk, and not a 2% risk, you'll never make it. Asset allocation in your own personal portfolios has never been more important. There are some sectors in your portfolio that have benefited from what's gone on in the market for whatever reason. They've gone up sharply, and others have not done so well. Well, you know what? It's time to rebalance. And maybe what you want to do is reduce the area that's grown so much and buy into the area that's declined a little bit. Now, that goes against human nature because people say, well, you want me to sell my winners and buy my losers? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Well, that's the way you do it. You're supposed to buy low and sell high, not the other way around. I was very interested to hear that the sponsor here is an energy company. You all know what's been going on with the price of oil. 46 bucks a barrel today. What's going on in the oil market, folks, is classic economics. All those Saudi people over there, they all go to Harvard. They all read the same textbooks I did. Then they go back and they play our game. Something we can't do in this country. But they're acting exactly as the way you would expect a monopolist to act, aren't they? They're threatened by real competition. This fracking is no joke. Fracking at 70 bucks a barrel makes sense. Fracking at 46 bucks a barrel may not make sense. 
And so what you do if you're a monopolist and you can stand the pain, you shove that price down. You let the supplies keep going. You got sluggish demand and you got a guy controlling the supply and the price is plunging. Those fracking in, that fracking industry shrinks, they're not coming back. They'll put a risk premium into the price. Next time, to invest in the fracking industry, it'll take $100 a barrel of oil to do it. They're not going to take the chance because the Osiris could do it again. Once they get the competition out, not all of it, if you're an investor, you try to figure out which company is going to be left, and then you slowly let the price go up. That's what a monopolist does. And so those energy companies that are left will be very profitable again. But it takes time and understanding and a, a strong stomach. But that's what's going on here. And we don't do a thing about it. It's illegal to do that in this country. Our antitrust laws don't let you do that. But that's a cartel and Saudis, they control everything. They got oil on the ground that's profitable at 20 bucks a barrel. They can do this day in, day out. They don't care. People aren't going to say much. We like the gasoline, don't we? Two and a quarter, two thirty, it's wonderful. Can you imagine what happens in this country if gas goes back to three fifty, where it was just a couple of months ago, quickly? Holy smoke. What it means is it's killing our ability to be energy independent. That's what this is doing. In the short run, it feels good. People have more money in their pocket. What they're doing with it. You don't really know. They could be saving some of it, not spending it all. It isn't a pure tax cut. But the fact of the matter is, in the long run, it's a huge negative. Because it means that the hopes of energy independence is just a hope. This is tough. It's tough for an economist to talk like this. It was much more fun in the 80s going around telling people things are great. It really was. And I always worried when I worked at Putnam, what would happen if I ever had to change my story and I found out. They don't like bad news in the, in the business. They don't like it because people, people won't buy things. People make money in good markets and bad markets and good economies, bad economies. You know that. So what you want to do is you want to be realistic. You want to be an optimist. You don't want to be a pessimist. Just be a realist and realize that this is a situation not unlike one we faced a long time ago, the solutions are known, and all we need to do is take advantage of them and do what's necessary. Because then, hopefully, I could come to this group and honestly tell you that we've turned a corner, that rocket ship has reached escape velocity, and the sky's the limit in the equity markets, and certainly in your business. Like I said, just know what to hope for. You want to hope now for higher rates, not lower rates. You want everybody to wake up tomorrow saying, oh my God, rates are bottomed out. They're going to be higher in six months. Watch the business flow. You won't be able to handle it. That's the problem. So that's really, in a nutshell, uh, this year's discussion. The likelihood is no recession this year. But it's perceptions that count. Markets anticipate things. And for goodness sakes, if you know any politician, you have any, any connection whatsoever, make sure they understand the way this system works, because most of them really don't. So I want to thank you all for being very, very patient. And, uh, and I'll be glad to take a question. Yes, sir. Uh, well, and I'll repeat them. Uh, right. We'll, 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 start, we'll start with this gentleman here, and then we'll go... Uh... Clockwise. And I'll repeat the question. And by the, yes, and repeat yeah, the question. Yeah. Talking about energy, why do we not do more electric cars if we want to save energy? The question is, why don't we buy, build more electric cars if we want to save energy? Uh, things are slow. Uh, you know, we're just very slow to react to these market changes. I'm, I'm sure people don't believe it's for real. What you need there is a very high price of oil to make it feasible. And we've got a low price. This low price of oil makes a lot of these, this technology uh, very expensive. You get $100 a barrel oil, $150 a barrel oil, and I assure you the investment in the electric car business will pick up. Yes, sir? Uh, 
we got to Carl Molin. Carl, why don't you pick on Peter Molin? Right. Will the, uh, the American dollar, which is very high now, affect what's going to really happen with Europe and some of the other countries trying to buy our goods? I mean, this should be a real negative situation. could hurt the economy uh, drastically. Well, you all heard that, and that's exactly what I was telling you. Our exports are slowing down. The high dollar makes our exports more expensive, and we get priced out of other markets. And that's a real negative on the demand side for us in this country, no question about it. A rising dollar, you know, is not necessarily a blessing. Ken Nelson. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about your, your, uh, your, your lack of concern with the, uh, uh, with the deficit. I mean, what, to some degree, you're a Pollyannist in terms of believing that if you allow the government to spend, you know, uh, spend more money, we increase our debt, that they're going to spend it on good things like infrastructure that's going to improve the economy. The fact is, we spent $5 trillion in Afghanistan and, and, and in Iraq, uh, which means, no, except for building a few tanks, it doesn't do anything for our economic and we do economic position. So you're assuming that in Washington they're going to spend it on good stuff that'll help the economy in the long run, but our experience is they don't. I understand what you're saying, and you're and you're absolutely correct. If I if if you if you believe that if that's the assumption you make, okay, that they will waste the money, then. And I made, if I made that assumption, I'd be more negative than I was, this, you know, tonight. I mean, you're right. We wasted, we got $800 billion four or five years ago. The tar, uh, the, uh, I think it was the TARP or whatever, the Treasury, yeah. Treasury spending, we wasted half of it. Yeah. And the problem there is you can't go back and now tell people, hey, give me more money and we'll do it right next time. That's the problem. So I don't disagree with you there. But even if it's spent unproductively in this country, Pay a guy to dig a hole and pay him to pay. You get nothing out of that. But they have a check. If they go buy clothing, if they buy a dinner, that gets things going. Spend it overseas. There's no productivity. Lots of it's lost. If I told you they lost $12 billion in Iraq, would you believe me? Cash. Mm -hmm. They put it on pallets and they brought cash over to get their banking system going. It got stolen. You didn't hear about that. So yeah, can they screw it up? Absolutely. The reason we're in the hole we're in is because the government doesn't do what it has done in the past. So I don't disagree with, with that, but you must be consistent. Because then, then, then your economic scenario is very, very negative. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, before we continue with the questions, uh, the speaker was accused of being a Pollyannist. Uh, by the way, a speaker's religion has nothing to do with the topic of the uh, Gene. talk about energy independence, ultimately you bring into the discussion the new technologies. Okay? And also, you think about the cost of the, the uh, gas, the methane, the oil that we're harvesting, but we're leveraging a resource which is in fact limited, which should be used not to burn and generate electricity, but as feedstocks for the chemical industry. The mindset of our society is, I want something now, and I don't give a damn about what's happening tomorrow. I don't understand how to break that cycle. And this is something that I, I'd like to hear from you. Ultimately, the industries that could say, that say society, society as a whole, the nuclear power industry, the alternative energy sources. No money at all is being used <coughs> anymore to try to build that industry. We're back to the same old hole. We're just burning fossil fuels. We're never going to get out of this rut if we don't have some novel thinking. If you looked at the New York Times today, there was an article that had to do with the level of ocean rising. Okay? We have now confirmed that the, the level of ocean has risen five inches in a matter of a very short period of time. This is going to put underwater Bangladesh and other countries. 
Nobody seems to be paying attention to that. Okay. I get it. <clears throat> Let me just tell you, the way the system works, and, and your concerns are, are, are real. The way the system works is, if, in, a, in a free enterprise system, if it is not profitable, it won't be undertaken by the private sector. The only thing that matters to a businessman or woman when they make that decision is the bottom line, period. And yes, it is sh it's short term oriented. Forget about patriotism. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Forget. That's a wonderful notion, which is why a government's supposed to have a bigger vision. But when, the, when, when they put that price at 46 bucks a barrel, it makes a lot of the things you're talking about unprofitable. As, as good as it would be in the future, we don't care. Unless you make a profit. That's the problem. When that price goes to 150, 200, you bet there's going to be people using their intellect to find alternatives. If they don't, if it doesn't, they won't. And it's just a fact of life. It's just the way it is. Fracking came to be. Because oil was at 120 bucks a barrel. It made sense. It doesn't make sense anymore if they think the price is going to stay at 46. That's the game the Saudis are playing. Uh, Alec. I, you know. Alec. My question is, there's a movement in the country to raise wages. So basically, uh, rather than the government doing it, you know, making private enterprise, take, basically taking more out of the pockets of you know uh, the, the people who are at the top one percent and putting it in the you know, which seems to me that you're saying is good, but on the other hand, it has negative effects. Obviously, and it will restrict you know some other areas. Is it a net gain to do that or a net loss? In the long run, it's a loss. You cannot pay people in the long run more than they produce. Period. I mean, it's just the way the markets work. I mean, you think about a, a guy that, that's sweeping the floor at seven bucks an hour. It pays the owner to keep him there at seven bucks an hour. Now the government says, you got to pay that guy $15 an hour. You've got to fire him because the government won't let you pay him what he's worth. It's just the way it works. In the short run, if he's still working, does he have more money in his pocket? Sure. But the system adjusts. You can't do it. In the long run, our system is designed to pay you an amount equal to what you produce. No more, no less. And you want to see how bizarre that is? And you'll like this one. Does it make sense to anybody in this room that A-Rod, the baseball player, if you remember this guy, right, A-Rod, makes 40 million bucks a year. The best neurosurgeon in this country might make 20 million a year. That's a lot of money. But you know what the markets are saying? They're telling us that A-Rod is worth more than the neurosurgeon. And guess what? In economic terms, he is. In social terms, not a chance. And that's the problem that we have. We mix up our economic system with our political system. Social justice and economic justice, and we talked about this year after year here. They're different terms. Economic justice, social justice, they're different. Totally different. So yes, would it be a nice thing if we could take from this fellow and give to that fellow and everybody would be happy? Think about a classroom with 40 students in it. And you're going to give a test. And 10 students spend three nights up all night long, no dose, coffee, whatever, studying for that damn test. And then they take the test and guess what? There are 10 A's, 10 B's, 10 C's, and 10 D's. And the teacher said, you know what? That's not really fair. I'm going to take a grade away from those A's and give it to the D's, bring them up. B is still a good grade. Well, guess what happens the next time you give a test? They're going to say, you know, I'm going to study all night long and get a B. I'm going to get a B anyway. Why should I do that? And you know what's likely to happen? They get C's next time. You can't do it with this system. We're asking this system to do what it is not designed to do. And that's a reality. You don't get it on MSNBC, you don't get it on CNBC, and you don't even get it on Fox, because nobody wants to call it the way it is. Our economic system discriminates. It does. Not by color, not by race, not by religion. By ability to produce. It's not fair to have a race, start everybody at the starting line, and then halfway down there, the one guy you're running too fast is going to tie your hand and a leg behind your back. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Jason, I just, I, 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 I just, I, 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 all right. 
Uh, if that were the case, if you had a true free market, I would agree with what you're saying. But it's all the, the market is rigged; it's fixed. Basically, we have people running the country who should be in jail today in terms of the the, 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 the corporate heads who, who brought who had to be bailed out. And so, it, 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 at this at this point, the major distortion in the market is not coming from the guys sweeping the floor. It's coming from the the heads of a lot of the banks, etc., who you know have been have been uh, you know manipulating the system. We can, we can argue that all day long. I understand that if you had a perfectly free system, you'd have monopoly and there'd be a real mess. That's why we have antitrust laws. But these are the problems we face. Jason. There was an article in the New York Times a few days ago about these mega infrastructure projects that China is investing in, yeah. um, multi-billion dollar bridges and tunnels, etc. And by some measure, the Chinese economy is now the largest in the world. But you said that our economy is the envy of the world. Can you talk a little bit about what China's doing right or wrong and why their you know, press re recently is really not that big of a Yeah, very, very quickly, China is not larger. Than, we're, we're three times the size of the Chinese economy. So let's just put that one down. If you've ever been to Beijing, you will see the largest apartment buildings you will ever see in your life. I mean, they're, they're unbelievably huge. There's nobody in them. Central planning doesn't really work. Does, does spending on infrastructure work? Yeah, but you've got to remember they got 1.8 billion people or whatever they got over there. It's a, they got an immense problem. They are not an economic threat to the United States. They're a military threat to the United States. And we've got to go very carefully because you don't want to shove it down their throats. We did it with Russia. Russia is a third or fourth rate economy with a nuclear weapon. Look how we tiptoe around Korea, North Korea. Because they're an economic power? No. So we've got to be very, very careful. But the fact of the matter is, what the Russians tried to do a long time after Gorbachev was they wanted a capitalist system with a democracy. They tried to put them together and it blew apart because they're not really compatible. A, you know, a capitalist system is much more compatible with a benevolent dictator who says, hey, you're worth six bucks an hour, that's what the market says, that's all you're gonna get. And she gets 20 bucks an hour because that's what she's worth, and if you don't like it, we'll shoot you. That, that's how it works. <laughs> Very efficient system, you lose a little freedom doing it. China, China is not a threat to the United States economically, they are, they are militarily. We have a question, on, actually we have a question over here. Hi, Kevin O'Neill, Sunrise Solar. I really yes, appreciate Kevin. your talk. Thank you. Can you talk to this audience a little bit about what, what a carbon tax might mean and whether that might make sense uh, in order to you know, a, address the system and what we're doing in, in, our, in our economy right now? And if the system is not working, how would you change the system? What other system I, might you recommend? I'm, I'm, I'm glad we have another week and a half for this one. <laughs> Let me just tell you, as far as I'm concerned, a tax is a tax. Right you know, neutral. Revenue. Revenue neutral means you get the money from someplace else. So you're taxing here and you're spending it. it. It skews markets. It just skews the markets. Um, so that's the point. The other thing you have to realize is this. Let's say we, we do it perfectly in the United States. Okay? And we don't have smokestacks anymore. Our lines are underground. We, we use the tax if it worked, whatever. But China doesn't, Russia doesn't, Europe is doing its thing. It's one big envelope of air, man. You know, it moves. So unless you get the whole world acting together, it's, it's useless. You, you, it might make you feel better. I'm not saying it won't make you feel better if we do something, but it will really help not in your great, 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 great grandchildren's lifetime. Will it matter? How do we get off oil, should we? You get off oil by letting the price go to 150 bucks a barrel or wherever the hell the market takes it, and you'll see the genius in this country come out. That's not being patriotic. You'll see it. They're, they're there. They're just waiting to make a profit. They're not going to do it for nothing. Please don't think they will. They Good. won't. We have a time for a couple of uh, more questions. Hi, yes, Valerie Mazars, Oxygen Sanitizing Systems. Um, well, I agree with you in theory. You know, borrowing the money at that cheap rate is pretty you know, is a smart thing to do. Any, any of us in this room would do that. Um, however, when 70% of federal programs no longer meet their mission, and one of the two things in life that can guarantee is death taxes in a federal program, uh, I have a problem with that. And my grandfather was part of the CCCs, and when they went into that, they knew that this was a limited gig. 
and the, you know, their, their pursuit was to become employed in the private sector. And when 47% of Americans, 47% do not pay federal taxes, I am pulling far too many people in the little red wagon behind me. So I want to see economically, and that will help our deficit come down too if they're contributing into the, into the coffers, that those people are productive members of society. You, she makes a, a very good point, which is why we've got the problem we've got. I mean, the fact of the matter is that if you start the program, and you get the economy moving, what you find is the private sector does grow faster than the government at some point. The problem with the CCC and some of the others, they cut them off before they had, had their full effect. I'm not saying you can do this wrong. You can do it improperly. But there's got to be a right way to do it. We've got good minds thinking about these things. And I'm with you on the 47%. We're almost at a tipping point. Now, you want a negative discussion we can talk about, you know, the socialization of America and all the rest of it, but I'm telling you there's still time, and all I'm saying is if you see these things getting discussed seriously, that's a reason for real optimism, and don't tell your friends until you get the positions you want. Then tell them how optimistic One more question, Robert. Uh, just, just... Right. Oh, you talk, spoke about uh, monopoly with uh, soybeans. Now, I think the U.S. would have produced another million dollars, or a million barrels a year last couple of years. Now, isn't it a conspiracy theory between the Saudis and the U.S. that we're trying to hurt Russia, Syria, and Iran? I don't know. The, the, the answer to that is, I don't know. If it's a real conspiracy, you never know it. So for me to say, yeah, you're right, I don't know. I'll tell you this, though. 46 bucks a barrel is probably below the equilibrium price. They will hold it there until it's no longer profitable to produce. All these geniuses are going to say, hey, you know what, I'd rather be a lawyer. And they'll stop doing that, and then price goes back up. It's hurting them, and, and the risk there, of course, is the way you get people to forget about their pain is to go to war somewhere. Remember that. Uh, Russia, could, Russia, China's got Taiwan. I mean, you want things to worry about? We got them. Isn't that part of the reason why this is all to hurt them financially? No. The reason it's down there is one reason, one reason only. Saudi Arabia saw our, us as real competition. They do not want the world to not need them. And the way they do it is the way any monopolist would do it if they could in the United States. Shove the price down, force out your competition. When they're out, let it go back up. They charge more money and they charge less to us. Right? It's all, it, it, rising and lowering. It's all the same. The fact, that, what, the fact of the matter is, oil is a, is a world commodity. And what you've got now is it, it's in every single textbook. This is not rocket science. This is how they operate. If you let IBM do it, they would do it too, but they can't. Okay, I, I have room for one more. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi, I'm Jeff Strauss. I'm with Homebridge Financial, and uh, we had a chance to speak briefly before we walked in. And being involved in residential and commercial lending, um, you know, I'm very uh, interested to hear your forecast on where you think rates may trend as uh, this country was built on uh, entrepreneurs, small business, it almost like the banks, we need the depositories to, uh, to have their interest rates up because we don't want to put our money in the savings bank at zero percent, a quarter percent. Uh, you know, we need to put the money in those depositories so they will lend to small business to build, etc. Um, but with all the government debt we have, you know, will, can, do you think we will see a rise in interest rates that will spur those people to get off the fence, to buy the properties, to buy the real estate? As you said, you we pay that contractor to dig a home, fill it, they'll spend it. If you know if we're able to sell homes and can increase building, or they're going to go to Sears and buy the dishwasher, they're going to spend it. You know that's going to increase the economy. Um, and then just a segue, everyone's talked about with regard to oil. Um, the cost of the barrel has been high for so long. You know petroleum just doesn't go into our gas tank; it goes into plastics, it goes to consumers. Will so that help consumer spending? Maybe so. Kind of a twofold question. But All right, very, very, very quickly on the first part. Everybody is going to be watching what the Fed does this year. The common wisdom was that by mid-year, the economy would be in such a state, the Fed would feel they had a little leeway and try to raise those short rates a little bit, get back some of that liquidity they put in. Now the betting is that they let it go a little longer. Remember this, the Fed has been given two mandates, an employment mandate and an inflation mandate. Right now we are this far away from a real deflation in the United States. 
Nobody here, nobody, has ever lived in a real deflationary environment. You know why that's dangerous? And why the Fed is totally hopeless in that situation? Because if you think the price of a TV is going to be lower next week, you don't buy it this week. You cut back on spending. And that cuts prices further and demand falls further. It's a downward spiral. So will the Fed raise rates at some point? Sure. Will they do it in six months? I don't know. I will tell you this. If the Fed in its wisdom feels that the economy has improved enough to withstand an eighth or a quarter inch rise in the Fed funds rate, that's good news, not bad news. But right now, in the, at the Fed, they're looking at this data and they're looking at inflation and they don't like it at one and a half percent. They want it at two or two and a half, or they take three. And you got deflation going on in Europe. I mean, you have a worldwide deflation, you're right back in the 30s, which is where I started. So I don't want to leave people here with the impression that somehow I am a Pollyanna. I'm not. This is not a very robust forecast. I'm just telling you, when you're going to worry, please worry about the right things. As executive director, I, I have the, uh, maybe the last word or last comment. Uh, just to share an economic, uh, a brief economic story. At 19 years of, of age, when I was a mere boy and a beardless youth, as Groucho Marx might say, I went to my father after a full year at Fordham, and I had been a straight-A student in chemistry, and I said, Pop, uh, my father's from the old country, from Italy, I said, I don't want to be a chemist. I, I want to be an economist. <laughs> and my father, you know, his brother was a, was a chemical engineer and teacher in Bologna, wherever it was. And my father, in typical uh, Neapolitan fashion, uh, you know, just blew up like Vesuvius. <laughs> and with his accent, he said, you stupid, the economics is the inexact science, but the chemistry is the exact science. <laughs> and uh, I, that, that, that didn't blow over for an entire weekend. I was in the doghouse for the entire weekend. But this is by way of saying that inexact science or not, not, it is always a pleasure to have Bob here to kind of clarify and shed some light on things. And as an economics major, much to my father's regret, I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. And you know, just one thought. They call economics the dismal science for a reason. And I gave you the reason tonight. I want to thank you so very much. Happy New Year.